A couple of things I want to do for you today is to initially just look at a couple of things. Hey, it works. That's great. Just to share some points with you to remind us of what's happened. I, I've been a, appreciated having the opportunity to look at all the previous messages that have been delivered. Whoever decided to put you guys on Facebook did a wonderful job. And I appreciated that. It was good to hear that right from the open and the introduction, which I thought was a sterling job of giving you background information to the church at Galatia. They were indeed French who had come down there and there were three groups of them and they didn't really like each other, but they didn't like anybody liking, not liking the others. So they joined in. They were a warlike group. And the first thing I want you to know is that they had, the, they brought some of the gods of Galatia with them, of, of Gaul with them. And particularly the mother, this is one of their pri primary goddesses. She's the mistress of the wild nature. You see, if you've got a polytheistic God system, you create a God that, allow, that behaves like you and it's okay. Some people try to create our God to do the same thing. We need to be careful of that. So that's what they've done. Now, the only reason I've mentioned her is because the guy at the end, her consort, Atius, I'm going to mention next time I'm with you because he will add some import to what the word of God says. And you will understand why Paul said what he says when you hear of what they do in the worship of Attius. Attius was, even though he was a consort to the queen, to, to the goddess, he actually married a mortal. So you can appreciate she was probably wild in nature. The second thing I want to do is we don't have in our modern English Bibles the first the in the second person pronoun we don't have the plural or the singular mentioned we just have you or whatever word we're choosing to use and it's important sometimes to understand that because we want to know when when somebody is speaking to the collective whole or to an individual and when we come to our first part of our book today we're going to find out that there are singular and there are plural uses of the word but before we do let's talk to the lord father we thank you that, you that you are the God who cares for us every moment of every day. So, Father, we ask that this morning you would guard the words that are spoken, that the words of our mouth may bring honour to you. And, Father, we pray that you would also guard the meditations on our hearts, that they too would be in tune with you and bring honour to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've taken a moment just to give you the singular and the plural uses of the word you there. Most of them are the plural you. So that when Paul is speaking to the church, he says, formerly when you, talking to the collective whole, you did not know God, you were enslaved to those who were by nature no gods. I hope I'm reading the right translation for you. I'm reading out of the, the English Standard Version. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back as a collective group of people to be going to weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose slaves you want to be once more? Now, when we read on further in the chapter, we're going to find out he's actually talking about them accepting Judaistic worship. I've got to tell you, that spins my mind a little bit. I would have thought that a polytheistic God and the God of Judaism are vastly different but he's suggesting that the worship is similar. That's challenging. That makes us think a little bit. And he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. That's how you're displaying it. And we could add circumcision into there. That's the topic for next time. And then he comes to the very personal thing. And he says these words to the individuals within the church at Galatia. I am afraid I may have labored over you individually in vain now here's the point if there's change needs to happen in the church it's not up to the collective whole to have a meeting and say right we're going to do this stuff it's up to the individual to take that first step not then to get up and tell the church there's a bunch of rat bags and they want to change the way they behave it's about what you do as an individual and if god is at work in the church of god it will become a thing that just rolls on and everybody will get involved in do it individually it's up to one to make a change there's a fourth verse to that song that we used to sing and i've got a theological problem with it but anyway search me oh god remember that one 
Lord, Holy Spirit, start a revival. Start the work in me. Are you prepared to pray that prayer today? I don't know the state of the church here at, at Currabee. You do. I know who else does. God does. But does he need to begin a new work here in you today? Because that's the thought that's behind what Paul is saying. He calls it the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world that they're embracing. These are the Judaizers who are coming into the church and saying, you've got to do this, you must do that, you must do the other thing. And here's the problem. When people come into a church with things that appear to be good, that they're not necessarily biblical, they sound right and we embrace them. But they become burdensome. They're weak, they're worthless. That's the way the Holy Spirit sees it, because this is the word of God. It is not the word of Paul. Paul was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he wrote these words to the church at Galatia. God's word says it. We need to say that. I, a couple of weeks ago over this Essendon issue, there was an interview on television, and they interviewed the, the pastor from the church, City on the Hill Church down in Melbourne, and he's saying, but and the interviewer, and I used to respect this interviewer, but I don't anymore. He's gone right off the radar now. And he's saying, but you were, you were practicing this. I thought the pastor missed it. I remember Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham. His words were, the Bible says, the Bible says, folks, that's our tool. It's what God's word says. And God's word says that following the Judaizers is weak and worthless rudimentaries of life, of this world. Does that challenge you? It challenges me. How can you, having been free, want to go back into bondage now voluntarily? They were born into slavery. They want to go back into it. That's just simply absurd. But that happens so often in Christianity. Let's move on. If you want to put those other things up, Paul says, I've wasted my time. Then we come to the second part of the, the message, and let's have a read of it together. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. Boy, oh boy, is that double tongue? Let's unpack that a little bit. Paul is saying this. I am free. You are also free. And I want you to come back into that freedom again. Why are you putting yourself into bondage? That's really the unpacking of that passage. Paul, who studied under the feet of Gamaliel. He was our body. I've got to say this about the law of the... Pharisees and the believers of Judaism during the time of Christ, their law was not based, it was based on the law of the Old Testament, those 10 commandments or the 360 odd commandments that were there, but they had stretched that out. By the way, if you want to follow the Roman Catholic Catechism, just in case you feel you need to get become super spiritual, there are 2,990 rules you must obey. Anybody into bondage? Join the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not advocating that, by the way. I suggest there's something much better. It's called the Bible and your freedom. So not doing that. But that's what they had done to Judaism, the rules that they had put in. And they had added all these things. And those were the rules that these Judaizers were teaching, not the law of the Old Testament. And even the law of the Old Testament can't save us anyway. All it can do is point out what we've done wrong and put us on our knees before a holy God. So we need to trust him for it. So that's what he's saying. I'm free because I've got, I've shaken off all of that rudimentary worthless stuff of Judaism. That's all gone. Want to know how he's done that? Have a look at that in Philippians when he talks about it. He said, that used to be there. It's not there anymore. It's gone. You were free too, but now I want you to come back into that freedom. That's the plea he's making. I entreat you. And it talks about a binding, a commonness together, because we are all one in Christ Jesus. We're not individuals. We're one in Christ. Then he goes on. You know, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become your blessed, of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your very eyes and given them to me. 
Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you for no good reason. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I again am in anguish of childbirth until Christ be formed in you, I wish I could be present, present with you and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Here's the story. Paul ended up going into Galatia after he'd been badly treated at, at Antioch and Lystra. They stoned him. They took him outside the village. And that's what it says in, well, hold on. Better get on there. Acts 14, 19. They left him out there. They thought he was dead. When you stone somebody, you don't go for their feet. You aim for the thing that's going to kill them quickly. You know what that is? The head. So he was bruised, battered, and his eyes were obviously closed because of all the bruising. And they were able, the Christians were able to get him because the others thought he was all dead. They got him up there and he was able to spend some time with them. He would have been weakened. But that was good for the Galatians because he got to sit down and expound to them the word of God. And here's the challenge that some of those people felt. He says, it was a trial to you. And the trial is this, that sometimes we look at bodily ailments or things that happen to people as though God would do, or gods were doing the judgment of people. That's what they thought. But they didn't do that at the time. They rather embraced him. They listened to his words because he preached freedom to them in Christ Jesus. And that was wonderful. He wanted them to embrace that, so they accepted that. And... You know, just to prove that point, the Jude, the, the Pharisees came, or no, actually it was the disciples who came to Jesus when this boy was born blind and said, who sinned, this man or his parents? And folks, that even happens within the church of God. I've seen that. I had this dear Christian friend. I was very sick back in the middle 80s. And this dear Christian friend came to visit me every week. And I really relished that opportunity, but got a bit tiresome because they always had this conversation. Lance, what is the Lord trying to teach you? And he struck me one day at one of my high moments. And I said, I found out what it is. It's teaching me patience to deal with people like you. Now, I can't understand what happened, but he stopped coming. 18 months later, he came back. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. He came back and we invited him in. We sat him down. He said, Lance, I've come to ask you for, to forgive me. And he'd obviously been pushing himself up. I said, I can't do that. And you could just feel his chest hit the floor, bang. I said, I did it 18 months ago. We should hold no record against anybody. That guy was just preaching what he'd heard from other people that somehow or other, you've got to go and correct the brother who's sick because he needs, really needs a lot of encouragement. And he's obviously done something wrong that displeased God. Mind, I spent six weeks in bed at that time. And I've got to tell you, it was not good for us as a family either who sinned this man or his parents nobody but he was born blind so that god could be honored and glorified because he did that talking about blindness god always has the app, app, opportunity to when he does healing to do things that are just bizarre and, and outside of human control remember the blind man and what did jesus do I, tomorrow morning by or tomorrow afternoon i'm having a my cataract removed or one of them removed. So I'm having a, and I hope the doctor doesn't follow Jesus's plan. Spit on the ground, get some mud, put it in his eye. You don't put gravel in anybody's eye. You know that, I know that, but that's what Jesus did. Isn't that bizarre? But what he proved by doing that, he was God. That even he, though he did the most bizarre thing, the sight came back and his guy went down to the pool of Siloam Wash his face and he saw for the first time. That's what God does. Miracles. Where no, no miracle should ever happen. That's what he did for this man. I was once was blind, but now I see. And they received him as a messenger from God. And where was their joy? What had happened to it? 
they'd lost it. It's actually the Greek is more about your congratulation. You congratulated yourselves and that's all gone. That enthusiasm. Remember that enthusiasm when we had, when we first met the risen Christ? How's your enthusiasm for Christ today? Is it the same? Is it as passionate? There's it gone. Why? Because they were going back into bondage. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to keep this day. Well, they certainly had to keep the Sabbath. That was one. But they were keeping some of the other festivals of Judaism as well. It required time and effort because if you're going to look after your polytheistic gods, you've got to give them the best of what you've got. And that's what Judaism required as well. It's what you could do. But Christianity is not about what you can do because he's done it all. And you need to follow that and embrace that. And now he feels as though he is being condemned for telling the truth. Have you noticed the way things change in our world today? If you stand up against something that is wrong, they don't condemn what you think, but they condemn you as a person. It even happens within the church where somebody would stand up for the truth and the person is crucified. You did, you did, you did. By the way, could I just make this slight mention, and it's not part of this text. The Bible tells us not to judge others. If you want to judge somebody in the church, go take a good hard look in the mirror. That's the person you look after. Nobody else. You want to gossip? Gossip with him. Don't shoot other people in the foot. The Bible does say if you see somebody overtaken in a fault, let you who are spiritual. We had that happen down at Burley Waters several years ago now where there's a person did something that was totally wrong and we elders decided we needed to get with them and discuss the matter. And uh, we had never had a disciplinary issue to deal with. So one of the other elders wrote a paper and sent it around to all of us before we met, because we were going to meet an hour beforehand and be super spiritual and pray and get ourselves all sorted out. When I got the paper, I rang this guy up. I said, where'd you get this from? Oh, that's what we've always done. I said, but that's not what the Bible teaches. You know what he said to me? I know. I said, well, what'd you write it for? So he and I had a discussion. And at the end of that time, when we met together, as the, the four elders of us met together, I didn't have to speak to it. He did. He said, Lance has rung me about this, and we can't do it this way, because this is not what the Bible teaches. We did a preparation that day that we did not know was going to happen. And when we went to that time to meet with this individual, we were totally dependent on the Lord as to how we would take it. Guess what? We won that lady that day for Christ. Because she came to the church ready for us to do what this piece of paper said. And she had a letter of resignation in her purse, ready to give it to us. And she walked in there and she said, I found four men who loved me. And I could do nothing but repent. We do it God's way, God wins. We do it our way, only hurt and disaster. We've got to be devoted on him. These Judaizers were there for one reason. They wanted to cut them off from Paul because they wanted to be like the polytheistic gods, get all the good things that these people were going to give to curry favor with the God of creation. That's what they were teaching. Give them your best. And Paul says, I've got to start afresh. It's got to go like pains of childbirth again. And I wonder if he was thinking, do I need to be going almost stoned to death before I can come back to the church of Galatia? Was that what he was thinking? It was in hurt and agony that he won them for Christ. And the agony is still there because they're no longer in that place. I need to keep moving. And he asks this very blunt question on, tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by, and one by a free woman. And he spends most of the time, interesting enough, as we look at the text about Hagar and her son, not mentioned by name. But the son of the slave, slave woman was born according to the flesh, and in other words, naturally, while the son of the freed woman was born through a promise totally unnaturally i gotta tell you sarah the bible tells us was well past childbearing age when she gave birth to isaac 
Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. That's a challenge to the Jew. Because Jerusalem is a very sacred place to the Jew, particularly in the times of Paul. For she is in slavery, as are her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are, who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate ones will be more than those of the one who has a husband. And there he's talking about the children coming back into from captivity, back into Jerusalem, destroyed broken up but God was there in that place now Paul appeals to the history and he says listen to the law listen to the law he says in Exodus uh sorry not that's not the right passage but he says in in and Luke 9 16 and 29 he said but Abraham they have the this is the story in Luke 16 is the story about the rich man and Lazarus remember the guy they both died the poor man who ate the crumbs and the rich man is asking Abraham to do something for him. Touch my tongue. Do something for me. Get over here. Put a bit of water. Well, look, send Lazarus back. Tell my brothers all about this terrible, terrible place I'm in. He said, they have the law. Listen to the law, said Abraham to this man in paradise, from paradise to where he was in Hades. Listen to the law. You need to study it fully because the law they're teaching, look at all of the bondage things the Jews had to do. Look at all of the feasts they had to celebrate. Look at all of the offerings they had to give. Judaism was not freedom. It was bondage. But freedom came as those people who responded to God and said, Lord, I can't do this. Only you can. And we are thankful to God for those men and women who through the time of the Old Testament, despite the law, trusted in the living God. And what we find is he takes the law back beyond Mount Sinai. So it's more than just 10 commandments. It goes right back to the law and the promises given to Abraham. The promise that God would build of him a great nation. There are two guys in the Old Testament. Abraham is one of them. The other guy is a fellow called Jacob, who tried to circum tried to think God was just too slack and too slow. Jacob was promised that he would he, the younger of two twins by just minutes because he hung onto his brother's ankle as his brother got hauled out of the the womb. He was there. He wanted to be first. And God said he would be first. God said he would be the leader of the people. And it seemed like dad was dying. And so mum got in this. We need to do something about this. We need to short circuit the system. God's just asleep. How can you be the leader? So they hatched a plan so that Jacob would become the senior brother. He would get the birthright. I really dislike that. I wanted to know how God was going to do it. Wouldn't you like to know that? But we're not told. God worked in spite of the sin of Rachel and Jacob. We know that. But God had another plan and we're not told what it was. Abraham was promised that he would have a child by Sarah. And they hatched a little plan. Well, Sarah did. Hey, God, I'm getting, uh, hey, Abraham, I'm getting too old to have a kid. She was quite ancient by this time and but it's okay i've got a servant girl out there you can go and have you well i don't need to spell it out to you do i you know what i mean and so abraham went in there and ishmael came and what a curse that has been to the jew ever, ever since but that wasn't god's plan when god first told abraham that he was going to do that at 75 god he said to god but god I, yeah i haven't got a son but he will do my this senior seven of mine he can be the one no, no. He said, you will have a son. God made a promise. 
25 years later. Who's waiting for 25 years for God to do something that you knew he was going to do? I've got to tell you, that's, that's a long time ago. That's a third of my life. To wait 25 years for God to fulfill his promise. What I like about this story that Abraham and Sarah were still intimate together, even as, as an older couple. Isn't that wonderful? Have you ever thought of that? I haven't, but did last week. They were still in love. Because they didn't plan how now. Tonight's the night Isaac's going to be conceived. That wasn't the case. But God, in his promise, God opened her womb as an old lady. And she conceived and bore a son, Isaac. You see, God steps outside of the natural into the unnatural to prove he's God. Just as he gave sight to the guy who was born blind with mudded eyes, he gave life to a newborn through an old lady who was well past the time of bearing children. God can do it. Trust him. I, when we first moved up to uh, Wurongiri, where we now live, you don't have to spell that. You can, T-H-A-T is that, by the way. Uh, but we, uh, on the Sunday after we moved in, I'm sitting at my desk with boxes and papers and stuff everywhere. And there's a prayer letter from the PSSM Mailbox Bible Club. I opened it up to find out they're looking for a president for their committee. And I thought, I can do that. So we started chatting together and a few weeks, months afterwards, I, I accepted the position for them, not knowing that that was going to be a trial for a number of reasons. One, a couple of years ago, the lady whose home it was in um, decided she needed to sell her home and she needed to get the office out of there and they needed to find a new home. Now, they're not flush with money. They've got some money there. And they went around and looked at offices they could find up in Moray Field and they couldn't find anything. I said, look, we've got to trust God with this. We're going to stand still. One of my favorite verses is Moses standing beside the Red Sea saying, stand still and see the salvation of God. You've got 2 million Jews been in slavery for 400 years. Well, they weren't all in slavery for 400 years, but you know what I mean. They've got the Egyptian army there and they've got the Red Sea in front of them. And he says, stand still and see the salvation who's going to stand still they'd be wanting let's build a boat let's get something together no he said stand still be silent and that night god provided a way of escape and i said to this committee we need to stand still and, and let god deal with this and he did he gave us an office at creekside for 12 months free of charge Creekside said you could have it for 12 months. They said, we're going to extend it for another three. But then they found out they couldn't because they needed it for church offices and stuff. That, and the school was growing up there, their school. That was wonderful. What are we going to do? You know what I said to them? Stand still and see the salvation of God. We chose not to advertise. We chose to trust him. So we prayed. I was down seeing Andrew Grant at CYC because uh, I used to be on the board of CYC. I say used to. I only resigned on Friday. But um, it's another story. But I was down there and he was talking about this new property that he would bought up at Catharaba. He just settled it on the 24th of November. And I was talking to him just as it was being settled. He said, Lance, we've got a place up there. We're talking about a separate menu. Why don't you come up there? You sure? Yeah, that's fine. And I didn't, I knew where Catharaba was. I'd been up that way. I didn't realize it was so, so far away from nothing. Um, those who have been there, I know Trev and Lynn have been there, and I don't know if anybody else has. It's, it's a great place, though, isn't it, Trev? Awesome place. But you can come up there, Lance. But we needed to find a new director, too, because our director resigned, and we didn't have anybody to, to serve the ministry. Well, CYC came to the party again indirectly. They appointed a man from Yak and Danda to come up as the site manager. I said, what about his wife? What's she doing? So I rang them up told him what I needed and found out his wife was a qualified teacher, just what we needed. We waited until they came up, sat down with them. And my committee just said there and said, how can you just trust God like that? He provided a place. He provided the right person to do the job. It's going to carry it forward. 
it's hard at times to stand still and see God at work. We want to get in there and do something about it, but we come, become slaves to the things. And if you're doing something and it's hard yards, it's probably slavery you've embraced. Let God do the work. And look at it, Sinai. Who would have thought Mount Sinai was equated with the things of the world? Who would have thought Jerusalem was? But that's what the writer to the that's what Paul has said to them. This is waste, worthless, elementary principles of the world. But there's a freedom, and that's from the Jerusalem above, the God who came to this world, who's building for us a home, a place that will be ours for eternity. And it's always free always free i know time's getting on so we need to go there and that's a quote from isaiah 54 1 please don't have a look at that and now the application i like applications when especially when the writer puts them there now you brothers like isaac are children of promise promise equals freedom just as at the time when you were born according to the flesh persecuted persecuted him who were born according to the spirit so also it is now but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her, for her son and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the freed woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. And here's the points. As children of promise, as free people, here's the challenge. Those of the world will always persecute us. The Bible teaches us that those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And folks, let me warn you, it's coming to Australia rapidly. Rapidly. It's going to become harder and harder to live for Christ. Then you've got it, but you've got to get rid of that empty, worthless stuff that does nothing but put you into bondage. Get rid of it. You want to know what to get rid of? Go talk to the Father above and say, Lord, show me. Tell me the things that I can get rid of. But above all, the Spirit of God confirms that you're free. Folks, a great passage of Scripture. I pray that it will make a challenge to your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O Lord, that you will be with us this day. Help us to understand that we are your people, free, truly free. Help us to live in that freedom. Father, if we have not trusted you, then we pray that you would give us the courage to do just that. If we have not followed you when you've asked us to follow, if we've not stood still when you've asked us to stand still, Lord, be gracious to us. But Father, we commit ourselves to you today to use us for your glory in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.